I'm Alec Baldwin, and you're listening to Marketing Trends and the Leeds Art Week. With so many media channels and platforms in use today, it can be tough to decide which channel is right for you and your brand's message. But why choose? There are more opportunities than ever. And as we're learning every day, diversifying your portfolio has never been more important. We are very big into sponsored content and moving, although we look at all the traditional channels and we still invest there, we're also looking at non-traditional channels. So areas where PwC may have not showed up historically. So there's been the onslaught of a number of new curated business newsletters that are not owned by the traditional publications. But a lot of our business executives are reading those daily. So that is a new place where we increasingly put our media dollars. That's the voice of Matthew Lieberman, the CMO of PwC US and Mexico. On this episode of Marketing Trends, Matthew breaks down the reasoning for why PwC has started to explore all of its options across platforms and channels, and he details where the company is spending its media dollars. He also dives into the evolution of sponsorships and why shifting to a remote workforce is no longer a luxury, but a need. Enjoy this episode. Marketing Trends Podcast is brought to you by Salesforce. We bring marketing and engagement together. Learn more at salesforce.com slash marketing. Welcome to Marketing Trends. I'm Ian Faison, host of Marketing Trends, and today we are joined by special guest, Matthew. How are you? Doing well, thank you. Glad to be here. Glad to have you on the show. Uh, we're going to be talking about a bunch of cool stuff that's going on at PwC today, and we're going to get into your background. So first, how did you get started in marketing? So I have a very non-traditional background, and I'm not a classically trained marketer. I actually went to college for film and business, and was working at a couple of film studios right out of school on the creative side. I went back to get my business degree because I was interested in moving over to the business side of entertainment. And there was this firm called PricewaterhouseCoopers that the dean of our school wanted us to interview with, so to show that we could get our students into the best programs. And they were offering a very cool consulting program in entertainment and media. So I veered paths, went into the professional services industry, and spent the first 10 years of my career working in our consulting division. And about 10 years in, I decided I was ready for a change from the consulting life and had always been interested in marketing and been tangentially involved. So I worked on a lot of our custom research and some events that we put on for clients. And so moved over into marketing uh, for our entertainment and media team. And over the subsequent 10 years, moved up and held a variety of roles within marketing and came into this role about two years ago. And that gets us to today. So definitely a little bit different than probably some of your other guests, but been a great ride. Yeah. And I'm, I'm definitely going to ask you some follow-ups about, uh, about the entertainment business for sure, because uh, you know we love talking about it here on Marketing Trends, but also from the, from the 10 years that you spent there to now, uh, media has changed uh, almost 360. So well, we'll get into that a little bit later. But so tell us a little bit about your role as CMO of US and Mexico. So like most marketing executives at most companies, the role has changed significantly over the past couple of years. And I anticipate that all of our roles will continue to change. It's kind of what makes it exciting for us to be in this area. And not only is the role of marketing change, but our firm is really growing and evolving as well. So to put it in a bit of perspective for those that aren't familiar with the firm, we support a practice of 55,000 professionals strong across the US and Mexico in areas including audit, tax, and consulting. And we have moved from more of a traditional audit and tax business to the fastest growing unit being our consulting business. We've added in, in addition to our traditional services, things like products and digital solutions. So in every area possible, we were really transforming as a firm. And we have a very interesting yet challenging balance. So we want to have a one firm message because there are so many small practices. I often joke that we have 3,800 partners in the US, so we have 3,800 self-proclaimed CMOs. Each has their own ideas on what they want to talk about. So we really need to try and aggregate those as much as possible into consistent messaging. 
And we're also very regulated because we do audit companies. So we really have to take a look at who we're targeted, targeting because of those regulations and restrictions. So multiple segments for one company. And our remit includes all the typical things that most B2B marketers are focused on. So things like content, PwC produced events, industry events. Of course, all of those are virtual right now. So we've had to make a big pivot like everyone. Membership in our trade organizations, our digital presence, technology, data, analytics, media, hospitality, charitable, sponsorships, you name it. And we work really closely with our creative and our comms colleagues across all of our channels and with our sales team who sits separately, actually, to make sure that we are highly coordinated and targeted in trying to generate additional pipeline and revenue. And on our team, we have about 300 marketers that are all dispersed across the U.S. and Mexico. Fortunately, we were set up to be fully virtual before the pandemic hit, so the transition was easier for us than it was for most. And I think in terms of what it means to be a marketing leader for this firm, I feel really passionately about using our resources and our voice to help grow our brand, of course, increase sales, and work on developing the firm's overall strategy. It's really such an incredible opportunity as a marketing leader to be able to really drive the message of the firm, especially given the purpose focus of our firm. Yeah, I mean, it's such a, uh, you know, it's such a large company and, and there's so many different moving parts, obviously, you know, COVID and all the changes that happened didn't, uh, you know, didn't help a lot of that. But it's interesting that you said from your marketing perspective, having that distributed team, you know, really kind of helped. Was there something that you all like, uh, you know, a battle rhythm or some sort of uh, like cadence that you had that you kind of or like a decision making process that you had already kind of had in place that helped with that or uh, or what was it that made it easier? We did. We were effectively communicating via all the traditional means. But I think what really did change was a complete 180 in our marketing strategy. We had to be a lot more. Uh, empathetic in our tone to clients, really only release content or marketing materials that was going to help them in terms of how to get through the pandemic. And in doing so, we came up with a three-wave system, which was really number one, crisis response. Things as basic as, can your workforce work remotely? Number two, more of the operationalization of uh, your response. So things like are you effectively using your supply chains, especially if they're cut off from certain areas due to pandemic shortages? And then thirdly, strategize. So how do you really focus on becoming a winner as we get through this pandemic and hopefully once it ends? And that may include things like identifying new channels or new markets or getting into uh, different types of products or services. So we really came to a very clear framework around those three waves and ensured that we really focused, depending on where we were, that we were focusing on the correct wave and maybe the next wave. And at the same time, we built a daily scrum team that included a cross-functional team of our marketers, creatives, and salespeople to check in and ensure that we had consistent messaging, that we were getting out to our clients what they needed to hear, and that we weren't overwhelming them because you can imagine all of us who are in the business world are getting invited to things like a million webcasts and getting sent a million pieces of thought leadership. But how do we simplify it and make it in a way that really is relevant with implications for our clients? So that, in addition to having a much closer tie with leadership and having almost daily calls with them as well. Whereas before we were kind of off in our own bubble doing what we needed to do for marketing and would check in on a regular basis, we really had to ensure that we had a clear and consistent message and how we were focusing on people first, both our own people, as well as the greater community, how we were helping with protection and safety, and then ultimately how we could help with business environment overall. Yeah. So how has that messaging changed to now? You know, obviously, like we're still you know, we're still in this um, and it's been going for a long time. You know, obviously it seems like the, the messaging changes potentially month to month or day to day at this point. What are some of the things that, that you have looked at as, as changing, um, you know, changing over time? Yeah, it's almost hourly at this point. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, so 
Uh, we have done a number of things in order to try and be as helpful as possible with our marketing message. One of the things that we did immediately, our senior partner, who's the equivalent of our CEO, reached out. And within two weeks, we had in the market published, and this was back in March, a survey of CFOs on their opinions around how the pandemic was influencing both their business and the business community at large. We recognized that was a white space, and that was a group where the CFO has access to so much information, things like cash flow and the ability to really pivot a company and for a company to be successful in such a challenging time. That survey has subsequently evolved significantly over the past few months. And we ran it every two weeks during the first three months of COVID. And it was fascinating because it had some of the best response possible that I could ever imagine from our clients, from the press, from analysts and others in terms of having real-time information from the business community, as well as having what that actually means for clients, not just putting out the data points. And so that was a huge success as part of bringing our team together. And that was one of the things that we were often discussing on the daily scrum, as you can imagine, it's incredibly difficult to get something out that quickly. We subsequently evolved it into now what we call five different economic buyer groups. So different groups within the organization. So in addition to CFOs, we have COOs and chief human resources officers as two groups, for example. And we've shifted it from not just pandemic response, but also things like the election and other issues like general economic issues, some caused by both the pandemic and election around uncertainty in the business world. So it is just something that we continue to evolve and use as a touch point for us to stay relevant in the conversation because we had to be very careful that we weren't just putting out content that we would traditionally do around things like why you should take a look at your supply chain. Now, getting back to that example from a few minutes ago, it's not why should you take a look at your supply chain, but you have major risks. Did we handle them? That would have been wave two and wave three. Should you be diversifying or moving or doing something along those lines to the supply chain in order to strategize? And so we have a number of different marketing materials that we've now created for our clients because we are squarely in wave three in terms of this crisis. And so we are now shifting our conversations to things like return to growth. So the world is what it is for now. Some industries hit much harder than others. But for many, they now face the quote unquote new normal. And even though I hate that term, it is a reality, at least for all of us for now. And so which products and services are they going to be developing? Should they look at things like their pricing models? How do they work with a completely virtual sales force? How do they train them up? How do they look at what technology they need to run their business? So these are all things that are very much top of mind for executives and where we're trying to focus our conversations now. Yeah, I'm so curious. So, you know, when someone is looking at PwC, who's a, who's a prospect, what does that buying committee look like? You mentioned, obviously, CFO and, and CMO potentially being involved. Like, what goes into making a decision to switch to you all or to use you for the first time? And what are the size companies that you're traditionally working with? So we're typically working with much larger companies, Fortune 1000 or very large and established private companies. And we have obviously a very strong competition out there in the form of the other big four firms, as well as general consultancies, as well as tech companies, as well as boutique agencies, you name it. So it's a very crowded world. Some of the things that we differentiate and win upon are the brand, of course. It's a very well-known and established name our relentless commitment to quality, value, so not just the cost, but what they're going to be getting as a result, our global network. We have over 280,000 employees across the globe. So we have the ability, if they're looking at a new market or operating in a different market, to mobilize our teams there real time. And increasingly a lot more lately, it's around a lot about what our company is doing and standing for around purpose. And we're starting to see that in a lot of the RFPs that we get sent. So they want to know about what we're doing around things like diversity and inclusion. So it's an interesting shift as we get from just traditional metrics into some more of what does your company or firm stand for? Did you find that that there was this moment of kind of that, you know, 
digital acceleration, you know, kind of scramble to figure out how to get everything in place um, after, you know, everything hit? Was that something that, you know, you saw accelerated conversations with y'all or was it something that kind of confused everything that was going on? Because it seems like it seems like it could have been a bit busy time for PwC as uh, as dealing with uh, with your all's clients. It was a really busy time. And it's interesting because there was an absolute acceleration hands down. And there was this real need for digital and technology capabilities. And it really proved one of two things for organizations, that they were either capable and ready for this pivot that was needed, or that they weren't and they needed to start to acquire those capabilities as soon as possible to become digitally fit for the next crisis. And the biggest area has really been around workforce. And so is your workforce able to work remotely? Are they able to use digital tools? Is your network set up correctly? And that's not a, a nice to have, that's a must have. And it's really interesting because we had some companies across every industry possible that you would have thought would have been ready and they weren't for a variety of reasons. So, you know, we had a couple of major technology companies reaching out saying, we don't allow our people to work remotely because we are very concerned about security and we don't want people taking or transmitting any information off campus. And we want our individuals to sit on campus. And ones that you would have thought would have been the fastest and easiest actually had the toughest time. And on the flip side, we had some companies that were in, in industries like industrial manufacturing, where they, I would have expected it would have been harder for them, but in reality, because they've moved into using various types of emerging technology, all of that can be controlled remotely. So it wasn't a one size fits all, and it really came down to each company and finding out what's important to that company in order to help expedite them along that digital transformation journey. Yeah, that is, that's fascinating. Uh, anything that surprised you as you were going through kind of that, that period of time? I think there was a, a couple of things. One was how disconnected most companies are and how that force, how this pandemic forced them to work together for the first time, because we are all so interdependent on each other and we need to be making decisions in almost real time. And there's no longer ability to do memos and meetings and discussions. Decisions just have to be made. The other thing I saw, which was a real positive, was this people first mentality that we heard loud and clear from our US CEOs and other C-suite clients, which was they really wanted to focus on worker safety, worker health, et cetera, and not reopening offices until it was safe to do so, making sure that there are employees who had dependents at home, they're offering up different types of programs. It was really heartening to see companies doing this. And even PwC has been a leader on this. And we're also developing things to help clients. So for example, we have a new product that we've rolled out that is a contact tracing technology for the office. And that's just one way that people can feel more comfortable going back to the office and for us to be able to isolate much more quickly. So things that we would have never thought about seven, eight months ago are already built and rolling out. I want to talk campaigns a little bit. Um, you know, you all have products and services, and I'm curious, like, how do you shape campaigns, like comparing products versus services? Like, is that, is that something that you think about? Is it both together? Uh, does it all blend together? You know, how does that work? It's ever evolving, I'll start with, because a lot of the products are newer for us and we're evolving into a more products and technology led company. With that said, we do look at products as being complementary to a lot of the services that we deliver. So very few of our products are actually standalone products that the typical business buyer would buy. They're typically sold with consulting services. And so the messaging often relates. And so we try and market them together. And we also have what we call our integrated solutions, which are tools that help us repeatedly and efficiently deliver services to our clients. So what we have to do is really focus on key areas that we want to be known for. And so we went through an exercise a couple of years ago 
to identify what we call our platforms. And those are the six or seven areas that we really want to be known for. And for a marketing activity to be approved, if it's for a service or product or combo, it needs to ladder up into one of those platforms. And those platforms are things like cyber and privacy, or um, another one is workforce of the future. So what we're trying to do is remove the disparate thousands of activities that we had historically that didn't land well and to refocus those activities, do less, but do them better and tie them into our main messaging and themes so that they get much more market visibility and penetration. So it's been a huge shift for us because we have a number of partners who reach out and say to us, why can't I market my service? It generates X million dollars a year. I've been doing it for 20 years. I've been doing this piece of thought leadership for 10 years. I sponsored this conference for five years. And the answer is, that is very important, but we really have to be careful with our marketing messaging in terms of aligning it up to the areas where we do want to be known. So we don't discourage them from participating in those activities or doing those things independently, but they're not going to be part of our overall marketing program. And so it's been difficult and continues to be difficult in terms of changing the mentality of us really being seen as drivers of the brand. Thankfully, it's been very successful, um, but it for each of those partners, it takes individualized conversations to walk through what this new strategy is. So, you know, as, as you're crafting campaigns, how much are you thinking, and I, I know you can't give like a ratio or anything of like brand play versus, uh, versus more tactical or like, you know, demand gen or ABM kind of strategy. Like, what are you thinking there? Obviously PwC a globally recognized, you know, brand. Uh, so I'm curious, how do you mix that up? So we, the way we define it is uh, brand and then what we call commercialization. And I would say overlaying both of those is developing and maintaining relationships. And in terms of our efforts, they vary quarter over quarter and of course, group by group. But I would say typically we're approximately 70-30 commercial versus brand. However, a lot of the brand type activities that we're doing are around more of our emergent areas. So things like products or the works with or working with our alliance partners who are the big uh, technology companies, or around some of our more tech forward cloud capabilities, less around more traditional services that PwC is already well known for. On the commercialization side, from the demand gen perspective, uh, where we spend the majority of our efforts, we are very focused on organizing around various campaigns. We have a major CRM system, we have hundreds of product codes. Everybody is tagged from pursuit identification through delivery uh, so that we can see what's selling, what's not, what the margins are like, where we should focus in more. It is very um, much of an analytics-driven play for us. And we are very much looking at how we can increase sales with new products and services as well as expand at existing clients. and. We have started to utilize some uh, new technologies, including using AI for predictive analytics. So for example, that helps us identify new accounts where we should be looking to sell based on a variety of factors. And that ties directly back into your question around account-based marketing. For a firm as large as ours, we really are challenged by doing ABM, or at least one-to-one -one ABM, as opposed to one-to-a-few or one-to-a-many. But with that said, we are looking at doing some more of this hyper-focused targeting and something that is on the docket for us to be piloting and testing more over the coming 12 months. When you're creating kind of those, those large scale campaigns, looking at, um, you know, you talked about, you know, protecting the brand, like what, what does that kind of like mean to you? What does, um, and I guess in a meta way, but also just like in a tactical way, like do you just make sure that you're protecting a certain amount of spend to do certain things or like what, what does, uh, what does that mean? Yeah. So they are identified activities around areas where we either are looking to differentiate from our competitors or to help promote some of the great things that PwC is doing in the world. So for example, for the first piece around protecting the brand, 
something along the lines of our audit practice, although audit is something that is more traditional in nature, it has evolved significantly, especially with technology. And there is constant competition for movement of accounts to different firms. So it's important for us to share with both clients and targets what we're doing in terms of new technology that we're employing, new processes that give them better assurance, highlighting some of our people and the different types of trainings and upskillings that they're going through and how they're providing a higher quality and more automated type audit. So that would really be around more of protecting the brand just so people know what we're doing in the audit space. We're not sitting on our laurels. We have significant investments and want to highlight those. On the more um, purpose side, PwC is heavily involved with a number of different initiatives. One of them is it was a founding member of the CEO Action for Diversity and Inclusion, which has a number of Fortune 1000 CEOs signed up to make proactive commitments around DNI. And this is a passion area for our senior partner and one where we spend millions of dollars annually. And so we want people to see what we're doing and to recognize that PwC is more than just their professional services provider. It is really a firm that is giving back to the community. So when you kind of talked about some of like those initiatives, um, you know, non-pure marketing initiatives, but things that you want to make sure that you know about. Yeah. As you mentioned, you have, you have, uh, you have tons of different things going on is, you know, like customer success marketing in that mix. How do you look at, um, you know, telling your customer stories, especially when perhaps some of them don't always want their stories, uh, told or made public. Absolutely. I mean, especially funny when you're doing things like helping out companies that have had a cyber breach. They don't really want to have a case study written about them. Uh, (laughs) So we, it it is, it can be challenging, but a lot of clients really do want their story told and we work very collaboratively with them. So in terms of your question on customer success, I think it's really twofold. One is how does that fit into the overall customer experience? We want them all to be net promoters and to serve as referrals, both internally and externally for others. But those case studies, which you reference, are of paramount importance to us. And we have a team that is dedicated to just creating and publishing those case studies. And the reason is, is that without fail, new clients want to know where you've done it, what the results were, who you did it for, was it something, a similar type size company or a company in their industry, et cetera, and have you done it more than once? The need for us to collect those stories, update those stories, ensure that we have them across the board for all of our different industry groups, all of our different lines of service, which are the audit, tax, and consulting for geographic markets, even have they done it already within, I know you're in Oakland up in the Northern California market, all those types of things factor in. And we're really trying to move away from just the facts into more of a storytelling point of view. So why we were engaged, how we worked together, what the benefits were beyond just the financial impact, et cetera, because it's not just a transactional project for us, but something where we want to be viewed as an ongoing partner with our clients. Let's switch to media. Um, you spent, you spent 10 years in media. Who are you working with? What were the type of, uh, what were the type of clients that, uh, that you were consulting? So the firm overall does every entertainment media subsector you can imagine. And we actually aggregate that into technology, media, and telco because there's been so much convergence in those industries over the past few years. For me specifically, I specialized in the film space. So I consulted for, up until a year ago, what were the six uh, major studios? And I'm not sure if there's any other consultants who actually consulted for all six. And I also had a lot of clients who are financial services institutions that were looking to invest in films or film slates or film production companies, et cetera. So doing diligence for them in terms of uh, what they were looking to buy and to validate the value of the assets. So what, like what type, can you share any of those types of, like what would be an example of one of those, those projects? The projects that we did, although we can't share company names, just to give a couple of examples, 
um, when a studio was looking to buy a independent production company that was incredibly successful. We went in and reviewed as kind of a fun project because you effectively pick apart the business plan that was uh, built by the target and rebuild it with reasonable estimates based on comparable companies' performance on industry projections and trends, our own industry knowledge, et cetera, to get to an agreed upon valuation. That would be that type of project. But we also did things for the studios in terms of things like finance effectiveness. So how do they close their books quicker so that they can report within a week instead of three or four weeks? How do we identify new markets for them as you start to, even pre-COVID, see some significant changes in market trends? So for example, in 2020, as predicted, and even as validated by the most recent data, even during COVID, China has overtaken the US as the largest box office in the world for the first time ever. And as such, how are you producing films that are more likely to be taken into the Chinese market because there are quotas? Are there ones that should be uh, not made for the Chinese market because there are censorship challenges? And are you starting to invest in things like local language films or production companies in those territories because expansion needs to occur outside the U.S.? So that would be more of an example of a strategy type project, but really end to end. Yeah, that's really cool. I, uh, I'm, I'm always so curious, you know, how those type of transactions, like the anatomy of those transactions, um, perhaps it's a, it's a conversation for a, for a different day, uh, on a, on a separate episode mm-hmm. here, but, uh, but I just find it endlessly fascinating with, you know, just how quickly media is changing and how quickly, like a lot of things, you know, a lot of, you know, smaller companies can, can now partner with larger companies to create things. The speed and quality of creation is, you know, faster and lower than ever before. Um, and the role of studios change, obviously like, you know, the role of music studios changed like completely overnight and, and seems like, you know, media is, is, uh, is going to go through something, you know, perhaps similar. Yes, we are certainly in the center of all those changes and it's fascinating and very concerning for a lot of those companies. And as you may have seen in recent weeks, a number of them have announced layoffs, restructurings, and reorganization of their business and things that you wouldn't even thought possible two, three years ago, where one studio just announced that they're going to uh, organize their TV business under the hat of streaming business. And that is something, I mean, talk about changes there, or when you look at film businesses and some of the studios uh, attempting to bypass a traditionally difficult relationship between them and the film exhibitors because the theater is being closed out. So releasing first digitally before the theater or allowing them as a very expensive pay-per-view on a release date. Those are things that were like verboten just a couple of years ago and have really been accelerated by the pandemic. Yeah. I'm, um, I'm curious, does this make it, uh, does this make you, Like as you're buying media as a CMO, as you're looking for media investments and creating content and things like that, do you have uh, do you have a different lens of of creating content, creating series, uh, or or creating things that um, are more of a production or or last last longer or things like that? Not sure about lasting longer because everything is going quicker these days, but definitely in terms of both the assets and the distribution themselves. So the assets, partly because of the technology that you were referencing and the ease and cost of creating it, we are really looking at how we show up in a different and better way, more visually, being able to tell the story through graphics, much more like traditional news article focus. Uh, So where PwC, for those who are listening, may have worked with PwC in the past, you would have been receiving hard copy PDFs than visual um, or digital PDFs. Well, now we've put into place a rule as of last year, no more PDFs. Nobody wants to read a 10, 20 page report. We're gonna give you the information you need and then we're gonna build interactive web pages for our individuals to dive deeper into the data if they want. And then in terms of the channel itself, we are very big into sponsored content and moving, although we look at all the traditional channels and we still invest there, we're also looking at non-traditional channels. So areas where uh, PwC may have not showed up historically. So there's been the onslaught of 
a number of new curated business newsletters that are not owned by the traditional publications. But a lot of our business executives are reading those daily. So that is a new place where we increasingly put our media dollars. And when we look at things like even sponsorships, we also have to look at where our executives and buyers are. So we are diversifying because it used to be we were a big sponsor of all things golf, for example. And we continue to sponsor golf and golf is critically important to a lot of business executives. But a lot of executives don't have an interest in that sport, for example. So how do we meet them where they are? So for example, things like film festivals. So we want to make sure that we're providing an experience to them that is going to be the most valuable possible. Yeah, I think that those type of we, we just had a, uh, an episode where we talked a bunch about a, a golf sponsorship because um, one of our guests uh, had just sponsored a golfer, and uh, and so we we talked a bunch about it. But yeah, you're exactly right. It's like for the people. I think back in the day, it was just easier to do those sort of things because you have like, oh, well, a bunch of people are interested. This is a great fit for us. Whereas now, it's like the same group of people are still interested that might be a smaller group but the affinity is still extremely high for golf but then you have to think of like what are the other areas that there's an equal level of affinity for folks that don't you know that aren't interested in that sport or or other sports or but you know any sport or, or entertainment or whatever it is i mean we see you know on this show uh it's a little different but for some of our other shows where we're talking to executives like tons of people don't watch TV anymore or, um, or don't have like any traditional like kind of TV. And, you know, people always talk about the cord cutters, but it's like, you know, there's a lot of executives that, that don't, that don't do stuff like that either. Um, and that they're like, well, the TV that I do watch is, you know, Paw Patrol and, uh, you know, Peppa Pig or something like that. So, you know, you, you have this, uh, you know, this affinity based, you know, sponsorship strategy, that I think is is can be extremely effective now, especially you know as you mentioned all of the you know smaller newsletters things like that. I mean, take something like Stratechery, Ben Thompson writes, which is you know a paid newsletter that doesn't have sponsorship. I mean, like that is read by a ton of executives, um, you know, in the technology and startup space, and it's not even open for sponsorship, right? So there's just I think that there are, and you know, obviously podcasts being a huge huge part of that as well. There's just different channels that people find that are that are their jam maybe they like the host maybe they like the writer maybe they like whatever but it's not as much about the publication than it than it was in the past absolutely and we had some custom research commissioned, which was really surprising in terms of what our executives were interested in and i think that this pivot is going to go even faster in the coming years as we get a more diverse workforce so as we start to get many more women, racial groups, all other types of inclusive inclusivity areas that we're focused on into the C-suite ranks, it's going to become even more fragmented. And I think there's some certain opportunities for some areas, and I think some will um, eventually, not in the near future, but you know, we're talking 10, 20 years, will have some challenge in terms of receiving the same type of sponsorship that they did in the past. In addition to the challenges a lot of them are having now with their events being canceled or moved virtually this year, and a lot of their sponsors having very limited budgets for the coming years due to the implications of the pandemic. As you're crafting those those sponsorships, like how how involved are you in those personally? Um, like how what it, what's what's the criteria that it uh, that it takes to get all the way to Matthew? So we have a sponsorships team that will first pre-vet and they will vet based on whether it's aligned with our firm's strategy, whether we're already sponsoring an event or whatever it may be in that space, whether it aligns to what clients are asking for, if we're already doing things within that market. So all types of things along those lines. Um, if they think it's then something of interest, they will then bring it to myself and then there's a couple of our colleagues and we will do an in-person meeting because obviously those are typically very large investments and we need the ultimate approval after um, our recommendation to go to them to sign those off so it then i think it goes from them to me then to the larger population of executives in terms of whether or not we want to make the investment but 
we are very interested in these things because we try and do a few of them, but really well, as opposed to spreading that money like peanut butter across a number of activities. Do you have a favorite campaign uh, that you've done over the years? One that we just called the PwC Pulse, which was the survey that we just published, um, the executive surveys. I love that one. It may not be the sexiest, but in terms of bringing our entire firm together quickly with real-time response and being able to have implications that help both our clients and society at large, that's why we're here. And part of our, what we call purpose is to solve important problems and to build trust in society. And that meets our purpose statement spot on. And then we've done some other very cool ones over the years that probably are more interesting in nature. But I would say one of the more recent ones that we did, which was um, a great one to work on, was we had a campaign around kindness. And it was all around that idea of asking our peoples to promote random acts of kindness and to be able to pull those stories together. It's amazing when you have 55,000 people, the creativity and the stories that emerge to show the impact that a firm like ours can have on the world. Let's get into our lightning round. These questions are fast and easy, just like marketing with Salesforce. Marketing Trends Podcast is brought to you by Salesforce. Salesforce brings marketing and engagement together. Learn more at salesforce.com slash marketing. Salesforce.com slash marketing. They've been with us since the beginning of the show. They have sponsored us since the beginning of this show, the very first episode. Check them out. Salesforce.com slash marketing. Lightning round questions. Matthew, are you ready? I hope so. Do you have a hobby or habit that you picked up during shelter in place? Actually spending time with my dogs and loving it. I used to travel 100% of the time and they're 10 years old and it's been amazing to actually just have them as they're both snoring at my feet right now. What kind of dogs? Uh, Cocker Spaniel mixes. Not quite sure. Uh, the rescues, but the cutest, the cutest guys around. Do you have a favorite book or podcast that you've been checking out recently? I'm a voracious reader, so I think that there have been uh, too many to count. But podcast-wise, I'm fascinated by some of the ones around the election and specifically around the current divide that's occurring in our country between two separate groups, less around the candidates themselves, but more around the challenges around what's going on in our country. When this is all over at some point, hopefully soon, <laughs> Um, what's the, what's the one either, you know, getaway or restaurant or, or thing that you're going to go do? I absolutely, I can't believe I'm saying this. I cannot wait to get on a plane, not just for work, but for pleasure as well. I've had like everybody, and these are great problems to have. I keep seeing calendar invites pop up with reminders of flights I was supposed to be taking for vacations that hadn't been canceled. So I am extremely excited to get back on the road and to, uh, make up some of those vacation vacations real time and most specifically um europe first uh the nordic fjords were the one that just got canceled so i think that one's top of mind if you weren't in marketing at all what do you think you'd be doing if i wasn't in marketing i would love i think my ideal job would be doing something in dog rescue i'm absolutely passionate about dogs uh, if you didn't get that from my first answer uh but more realistically from the business side I think I would love to try something entrepreneurial on the um, business side, doing something more startup. What question do you never get asked that you wish you were asked more often? That is a good one. I'm gonna have to steal that one for future ones. Um, I think related to this podcast, people really don't understand what PwC is in general or what we do. And I really wish they would take the spend, they would take a minute to spend the time to get to know what our firm does because it's so much more than just an accounting firm. So for example, wherever I travel in the world, if I say PwC, I'm in a bar or a restaurant, whatever, it's amazing. But people will be like, oh, you count the ballots for the Oscars. And that's what our firm is known for. And I kind of want to say, yes, all 280,000 of us count the ballots for the Oscars. No, we really do so much more. And I wish people would really learn about the vastness of our company. Yeah, that's that's an interesting challenge because um, you know you you it is like it's one of those things you know it's so synonymous with tax it's so synonymous with accounting 
um, which is a great place to be, right? But you do, you know, like the cybersecurity offerings or, or things like that, you know, I mean, you know, all of the media stuff that we were talking about earlier, like there's just, there's a lot of uh, meat on the bone per se that, that people don't know about. Okay, what would be your best advice for a first time CMO? Take the time to learn both the firm's strategy and its purpose. And that sounds basic, but from all of my colleagues that I talk to, it's one of the most challenging things because for many companies, that actual business strategy and certainly the purpose strategy are not clear, or even if they're written, they're not being activated upon. So I think that many, and I've even had a couple of missteps here, just want to rush as quickly as possible into building and executing a marketing plan. But if you don't, don't take the time to understand what you are trying to market and what you are trying to accomplish, you'll never be successful. Awesome. Matthew, that's all we got. That's it for today. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, for our listeners uh, who've never checked out PwC, I don't know what you've been doing, but go to pwc.com. Uh, any final thoughts, anything to plug? No, thank you. It was great having a chat with you today. Yeah, awesome chatting with you as well. Take care. Marketing Trends Podcast is brought to you by Salesforce. Discover marketing built on the world's number one CRM, Salesforce. Put your customer at the center of every interaction. Automate engagement with each customer and build your marketing strategy around the entire customer journey. Salesforce, we bring marketing and engagement together. Learn more at salesforce.com slash marketing.